This is the recording of a presentation that was originally given at a climate parliament hearing in Tunisia in April. We are uh, wanting to share uh, via the Agora portal some of the perspectives that were shared with that hearing on detailed tools by which members of parliament or congress or legislatures can hold government to account uh, in respect of promoting renewable energy frameworks. I'm Charles Chevelle. Uh, I was a member of Parliament in New Zealand uh, for seven years. Uh, I was the uh, Shadow Energy Minister and the Shadow Climate Change and Environment Minister for a period during that time. This uh, presentation draws on that experience and the experience of the Parliamentary Development Team and now the Inclusive Political Processes Team inside UNDP, uh, which I currently lead. There are three aspects to the presentation. First of all, uh, the how and the why of uh, monitoring a government's commitment to a renewable energy framework. Uh, secondly, uh, some consideration in detail of some tools uh, by which parliamentary oversight of the renewable energy sector can be conducted. Uh, and thirdly, some specific observations about what MPs can do in the context of the state budget. Let's start with the how and the why. Uh, I think uh, when a government has adopted a specific policy or legislative framework uh, concerning the promotion of renewable energy, there are really two aspects uh, to what MPs can do to uh, conduct effective scrutiny or control of the government in this regard. Uh, firstly, uh, I think what we need to do is think about having a, a, a good close look at the implementation of laws. Is the government uh, devoting sufficient resource uh, to the agencies that are charged with the actual implementation of the legal or policy framework? Now in this regard I think it's useful to have a look at a, a case study, uh, that of Senegal. There are laws uh, on the statute book already in that jurisdiction uh, to promote renewable energy, but the laws haven't been properly promulgated by the executive branch. So uh, through the Climate Parliament project, the collaboration uh, between UNDP and Climate Parliament, uh, MPs are being empowered to put some pressure on the government, uh, the Ministry of Energy, the Prime Minister's Office, the Council of Ministers, to press for the relevant presidential decrees to get that legislation promulgated so that agencies uh, charged with implementation can get on with their job. I think another case study that's of use in this area is, is Bangladesh. Again, uh, through the uh, Parliamentary Action on Renewable Energy project, uh, we've been working with MPs on a cross-party basis uh, in Bangladesh, uh, prior to the last election in particular, but also since. Uh, there's a Sustainable and Renewable Energy Development Authority, Shredder, uh, created by uh, an eponymous piece of legislation. It's yet to be properly implemented. MPs have been putting pressure uh, on the government to bring about implementation. They've signed an open memorandum to the relevant parliamentary standing committee asking that the committee require the Ministry of Power to present an effective plan and budget to implement the law. They've written open letters to the Minister of Energy and the Minister for Finance calling for the establishment of the authority. That is, the letters have gone to these ministers but also been published uh, openly so that people can see uh, the sort of pressure that's being put on the government. And in response, the MPs have been very successful because they've had uh, a reply from the minister undertaking uh, implementation according to a specified timetable. I said there were two aspects uh, to uh, 
uh, scrutiny and control here. One was ensuring that uh, implementation is actually occurring. The other is to do with the allocation of funds. Uh, if funding has been allocated to initiatives in the budget, or if tax incentives have been created, is the government actually allocating the funds in the way specified by Parliament? Are the funds sufficient to achieve the ends set out in the law or the policy framework itself? Um, and I think it's very important that, that parliamentarians pay attention to that issue as well as whether or not there is actually a, uh, an implementation plan per se. This next part of the presentation considers uh, specific tools to conduct parliamentary oversight of the renewable energy sector. And what we're noting here is that one of the specific tasks of a parliamentarian is to gather information and data to assess if and how the government is implementing laws and allocating funds re required. Now, parliamentarians have a number of tools uh, at their disposal. The first one that I think I'd like to mention is consultation. Parliamentarians should never underestimate what I think of as their convening power. People are interested in what members of Congress have to say. The media is interested. Civil society groups are interested. The industry groups that are affected are also interested because MPs in the end have influence uh, informally uh, by virtue of the, uh, the office that they hold. Parliament, parliamentarians can convene dialogue, they can get uh, stakeholders together, uh, they can find out through their taking of soundings what is actually going on on the ground. And parliamentarians should be consulting with stakeholders uh, on, a, on a regular basis just to to keep an ear to the ground and find out what is actually happening. This is a, an important and formal power that should not, be, uh, should not be underestimated. Let's look at a, another case study here, that of Congo Brazzaville. In 2013, some of the key stakeholders, including uh, the presidents of the Central African Development Bank, Congo's Rural Electrification Company, the director of the Agency for Rural Electrification and others were consulted to identify windows for parliamentary action and develop strategies for potential legislation. Again, this was done through the PARI project. In August 2013, a parliamentary workshop on climate change and renewable energy was organised and included inputs from a number of key stakeholders, including UNDP. NGOs were also involved. At the conclusion of the workshop, uh, a framework strategy for parliamentary action uh, was agreed and it, and it included developing a specific legal framework to support independent developers of renewable energy in Congo Brazzaville rather than uh, the traditional developers who had uh, perhaps been constrained by the previous regulatory framework. So this informal power of convening, of consulting, of bringing stakeholders together to actually produce action as well as to find information, is an important one. MPs can also organise field visits. Now sometimes these will be properly resourced by the Parliament as part of the representation function. Oftentimes, however, they just have to be done uh, as part of the MPs general workload. The parliamentarians uh, do have a unique opportunity to ask for access, uh, which will often be granted. Uh, if it's not granted, there's a good signal that something untoward is going on, uh, and the MP should, uh, should publicise this, uh, this failure to grant access. But hopefully access will be granted, MPs can see the technology in action, parliamentarians again can explore the impacts of the technology on the ground, and. Uh, take away ideas and inspiration for further projects. Field visits are also an excellent informal oversight tool. They allow MPs to witness firsthand if and how approved projects are actually being managed and implemented.
let's not forget some of the formal tools that are available to parliamentarians. Question time. In many, indeed in most parliaments, uh, government ministers have to come to the assembly uh, and answer questions about uh, matters that are of interest to members. This is an excellent example uh, for of, of, of the sort of accountability tool that is at the disposal of MPs. Based on information gathered through research, consultations, the informal mechanisms that we've just discussed, uh, parliamentarians can ask questions, including follow-up or supplementary questions where the rules of procedure allow that, uh, to require the Minister to state publicly the Government's position on particular uh, policy requirements or on implementation matters that the member might be particularly concerned about. If the question time uh, is done, is, is, is conducted according to a timely fashion or if the answer is particularly controversial, uh, there may well be an opportunity for the parliamentarian to garner profile for him or herself, but this can also uh, be used to promote uh, the MP's agenda, and if it's in favour of renewable energy, uh, again, it's a, it's a very good way to further interest in this, uh, in this important area. There are a number of model questions uh, that uh, MPs could put uh, in these sorts of circumstances. Uh, we have formulated and suggested a couple here based on uh, the uh, project's work to date uh, and we're very happy to work with MPs uh, to come up with further refinements uh, on these types of questions. I'm not going to go through them uh, verbally now because of time constraints but hopefully uh, they can be seen on the screen behind me and they can give an idea of the types of the scope of question and supplementary questions that can be asked uh, during question time and in respect of, uh, of written questions to ministers where that's uh, also a, uh, a tool available to, to members. I think it would be useful to think about a case study here again looking at, uh, at the experience of Senegal through the project. Uh, six parliamentary questions were asked on the precise uh, nature of the implementation of the government's renewables plan. Uh, they were put to the Ministry of Energy by MPs publicly in a committee meeting in October 2013, uh, very successfully uh, in terms of uh, putting the Minister's feet to the fire and exposing them to public scrutiny on implementation. Another case study, Morocco, 25 parliamentary questions drafted, 13 of which raised in the plenary of Parliament itself uh, and also in meetings of the Energy and Environment Committees, focusing on specific areas where the government had made commitments in the renewable space uh, and a number of them were answered by the, the responsible ministers. Again, nothing like the disinfectant of sunlight uh, to, to ensure that MPs are asking these questions in public. The government is required to answer them in public. The media and the public and interested NGOs and stakeholders are, are taking a, a real interest in, in those answers and can then take, uh, take those answers further and ask further questions to ensure that the government's record is being exposed to proper scrutiny. I think because of the importance of this area, we'll take one more case study, and that of India. Uh, it's been a, an extraordinarily important uh, achievement of the project that a cross-party group of parliamentarians since 2010 uh, was working to, uh, to try to get the government of India to lift its game on a commitment to renewables. And I think uh, we've seen uh, this effort bear fruit uh, many times since. Uh, the urging was to adopt a target of 15% renewable energy and to improve grid infrastructure. Uh, not only were letters written, but the matter was raised in parliamentary debates. Uh, 
uh, again, cross-party correspondence to the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, follow up with questions in parliamentary debates, numerous questions drafted and submitted to the government, uh, and as a result of this continuous uh, pressure and oversight done on a multi-party basis, uh, there was actually uh, significant success, MP succeeding in doubling the commitment to 2020 on renewable energy. The target was, uh, was raised, in fact, more than doubled from 6% to 15% in the new five-year plan. Another important tool that's available in many parliaments is interpolation. So what this mechanism tends to do is it requires the Minister to come to the Parliament and uh, engage in a debate on a specific topic of interest. In some Parliaments, uh, the interpolation procedure results in a, in a necessary confidence vote in the Minister at the conclusion of the debate. Uh, so it's a very serious uh, parliamentary tool. It should only be used uh, where there's a serious matter to be debated, uh, but it's a very effective way, again, of getting the Minister to come in front on relevant issues and provoking public interest in the question concerned. And let's not forget an extremely important parliamentary accountability mechanism, parliamentary committee hearings. One of the core functions of a parliamentary committee is to monitor the actions of government and hold it accountable. Many parliaments have uh, specific rules whereby committees can receive documents, require the minister or the head of the department to come along and attend the committee to answer questions. And this is a very powerful tool if it's used the right way, including for opposition members, but not entirely. Government members can use the process as parliamentarians as well to act as honest brokers and to require the executive uh, to come and indicate, first of all, whether they have relevant policy frameworks in this area, and secondly, whether they're doing a, an effective job of, of, of implementing what the law requires in the area of renewables. And uh, I, I, I really do uh, urge on uh, anybody who's watching this who doesn't have a developed committee system to think about looking at comparative examples uh, as to how they might strengthen the committee system of their assembly and we're very happy to provide uh, assistance and comparative examples in this area. Let's think about a, another case study here. The Parliament of the United Kingdom, since uh, it began uh, its experiment with coalition government, has seen a, 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 a revamp of the powers of the committees, particularly of the House of Commons in Westminster. Uh, to meet its Renewable Energy Directive target of 15% of renewables by 2020, uh, the government anticipates that about 12% of heat will have to come from renewables. To date, uptake's been a bit disappointing. Uh, renewable heat's been described by experts as the sleeping giant of UK renewable energy policy. So there was developed a renewable heat incentive scheme. It was planned to be introduced in the summer of 2013. The Energy and Climate Change Committee of the UK House of Commons led an investigation on the initiative. It called evidence, it held uh, public hearings. Uh, the evidence was used to identify witnesses for oral evidence at a very widely reported hearing in March 2013. This publicised the initiative, it drew attention uh, of the public to it, it made it very clear that this was something that MPs were looking closely at and it sent a very clear signal to the government that this was something that the public expected would be taken seriously and well implemented. So again, uh, the, the power of sunlight, the power of, uh, of bringing into the open uh, public administrative decisions at a political level and at a bureaucratic level, uh, very, very important uh, method by which members of parliament can play their scrutiny and control role. The final part of this presentation looks at specific uh, 
issues around the state budget. Now, depending on the specific rules that may be in effect in a parliament, uh, parliaments may be able to uh, exercise quite an important influence on the content of the state budget uh, to encourage more resources and incentives to be devoted to renewable energy resources. Uh, let's consider one or two ways in which this can happen. First of all, if the standing orders or rules of procedure of the parliament allow individual members to move amendments to the budget, this can be an excellent opportunity during the budget debate to showcase new ideas around renewables. Even if the amendment doesn't pass or doesn't have a hope of passing, it's a great way for political parties, for members of parliament to put up alternative ideas that can be uh, entering into the debate, entering into the mainstream, being publicised through the parliamentary debate process uh, around how to advance renewables. Uh, and in the fullness of time, uh, these ideas may well be adopted. They, they're not necessarily confined to new spending initiatives. They might include those. They might include tax incentives to, include, uh, to encourage greater private investment in renewables, for example. Never forget the budget is not only about spending, it's about the receipt of revenue, and it's about potential revenue relief to encourage ideas around renewables. Where Parliament um, does allow those sorts of amendments, uh, d sorry, does not allow those sorts of amendments, there's still scope for indirect uh, influence of the budget itself working through the political party or parliamentary group, working through parliamentary committee, working to encourage civil society. MPs can build political pressure for allocation of state funds or revision of the tax code uh, to encourage the development of renewable resources. So uh, again, the informal convening power is one that should not be forgotten here. And these should always, I think, be done uh, ideally as part of a, a more coherent, wider uh, strategy rather than as, as, as individual uh, attempts to either uh, diminish the tax base or, uh, uh, or encourage greater spending. But, uh, but clearly you do what you can in these areas. And again, the, the aim of the exercise here is to get attention uh, to alternative ideas to, to promote renewables, to demonstrate that there is a coherent framework of, of, of debate around doing so, and to uh, encourage, uh, advise, exhort, sometimes shame the government of the day into taking renewables more seriously. I think it's important to indicate that once the state budget passes, uh, and once these, this exchange of ideas has occurred, the role of the MP or congressman, congresswoman, uh, changes. Uh, once the budget's passed, it's time for scrutiny. So work in those committees, public accounts, budget and finance, energy, development, to ensure that the allocated funds are properly spent or that any tax incentives are being properly utilised. Again, public hearings are terribly valuable. Uh, they, they allow media to participate, civil society to participate, the industry itself to present its perspectives on what other things can be done. And don't forget the role of the, role of the Auditor General or the, uh, the Supreme Audit Authority, the Cour de Compte, whatever the particular uh, agency that's charged with auditing the state accounts is concerned. Form as close a relationship as possible with them, encourage them to be uh, proactive in terms of auditing the government where that's permitted in terms of the regulatory regime to ensure that commitments around spending or tax relief concerning renewables are actually being uh, delivered in the way that is promised. Uh, I think it would be useful to uh, have a look at a couple of final case studies in this regard. First of all, 
Tanzania and secondly rural India. Uh, in Tanzania, MPs are now preparing to press for at least 20% of the new government's uh, revenues are from offshore uh, gas uh, revenues to be devoted to renewable resources. Here's a great example of, of a group of MPs saying, all right, there's going to be specific uh, revenue from an energy-related source. Uh, it's coming from, from essentially a fossil fuel source. Let's hypothecate. Uh, a good proportion of that revenue to ensure that the state does have uh, a reliable source of investment going forward to promote renewables. Great example of, uh, of good policy. Another example from India, uh, in December 2011 the Estimates Committee started advocating the reservation of 1% of the entire uh, national budget to be spent on the development of renewables. Again, uh, good cross-party work, meeting with the Prime Minister, meeting with Ministers, uh, working through the committee, as we said earlier, to double the renewables budget, but also to take concrete initiatives, uh, encouraging the government to go ahead with some incentives for wind power, uh, looking at renewable uh, energy bonds, and tax incentives to, to get on with the renewables framework. We're committed at UNDP to uh, ensuring that MPs and congressmen and women have the tools available to them and exercise those tools to encourage uh, legislative and policy frameworks that promote development priorities. We're here to help. Renewables is, is one of the key initiatives in this area, but of course there are others. So please, at any time, contact me or my team uh, here in New York via email or otherwise, uh, we, uh, we're very, very keen to partner with you uh, to ensure success in these areas.